of what we're well good morning <laughs> it's uh yeah great to be back <laughs> um anyway so uh this is back to the original uh outline we talked last time about the uh parton picture and we really uh, in number two just uh got started here uh, with QCD and some general discussions about uh, how to use perturbation theory. And so the last thing that we did uh, at the end last time was to derive or at least give a, a, a summary of the derivation of time-ordered perturbation theory, which is just a way of writing Feynman diagrams. You pay a price for having more terms than the, simply the number of diagrams, but you get for it a certain, uh, I could say, transparency for the stories, the kind of quantum mechanical stories that each Feynman diagram is telling you. And the way you find one of these stories, what happens first, some particle splits, something is emitted, something's absorbed, uh, all of those stories, the steps that are summarized by a single Feynman diagram are unfolded for us into pages of a book, each one of which is a particular time ordered diagram. So uh, let's, so what I wanna do is uh, last night, I put together a, a summary of the steps that's, this is all part-time stuff, we kind of remember that, and we'll be hearing more about uh, the part-time distributions uh, from Maria's talk later. And uh, remember the part-time model extensions, fragmentation, the Drellian process, the idea of jets, and then here we got to QCD. And um, let's see, oh yes, so here, here's what we did last time. So let me just uh, try to tie this together with the discussion last time. Here we can imagine some graph G, although I wrote it here as A. Well, you know, it was late by the time I got to do this last night. Has an overall energy uh, conserving delta function, loop integrals, then line denominators, uh, some numerator, which is a function of the line momenta and the external momenta. And uh, just to keep our factors of i uh, straight, a minus i to the n, an overall i, and there should have been one more i here, which is the standard to make the graph real uh, for all external uh, space-like momenta. So I'll try and correct that. And then these were the steps that we sketched last time. And uh, here they're just listed without going through the technical details. But from, we go from loop momenta to from loop energies to line energies. By here's the identity that says you take a product of loop integrals, uh, loop energy integrals. You replace them by line energy integrals at the cost of adding more delta functions. And then these uh, constants here that multiply the different momenta tell you whether a line is moving along the direction of the loop or into the vertex or out of the vertex. So then you write the new energy delta functions, all of these as time integrals. And so you get one time integral for every vertex. So we discussed that last time. Then to get all the different time integrals, you just have to take this integrals from minus infinity to infinity of each times and write them in terms of orderings. So you have some permutation of those times, which we call tau, and uh, we call them permutations of tau, which we label by sigma. And for each such ordering, you integrate the time uh, from minus infinity of each vertex up to the time of the next vertex. And finally, the last vertex, the maximum time is infinity. And that's just a way of writing these integrals from minus infinity to infinity for all the times. And remember that example we gave of just the self-energy type of diagram, either one vertex is first or it's second. Those are the only two possibilities. If you go to n factorial for an n, n point, uh, I would rather a, uh, an n vertex graph. 
So then you can do the time integrals. Let's see. Oh, yes. So once you have done this, you can do all the energy integrals using Cauchy's theorem. Okay, so it's extremely straightforward. And then once you do that, the time integrals all just defined by phases. And the I epsilons or the I zeros that were in the denominators of the propagators have now become convergence factors that make all of these integrals uh, finite as, as they go to minus infinity. And the beauty of it is when you follow all this, all the I epsilons in the phases cancel in the last integral. And the last integral is just the sum of the external energies. And that re re you recover the energy conserving delta function. So here's the result, okay? So this is just an outline of how you do it. Everybody can do it. The only really subtle point is sometimes you have to change the sense of the energies. The energies will always flow. Positive energy will always flow from an earlier time to a later time. But because when you assign the energies, you don't give them definite directions, some, for some time orderings, you have to reverse the, the sense of the energy, but all the I epsilons work out automatically. So what you end up with for this amplitude is you reproduce your overall delta function from the last time integral, and you sum over permutations of vertices for all the loop momenta, the spatial loop momenta have completely been, um, they're spectators of all this, that it just happens while they're not looking. You get a product for every line of one over two omega i. Now this combination has a look of something. It has a look of phase space, right? And so actually this has to do with this interpretation of this as like old fashioned perturbation theory. You start out in the first state, a vertex acts. You now have a new state. What these integrals over loop momenta and these one over two omegas do is to make sure that you actually are integrating over all phase space for your second state. Then another vertex, you go to a third state. And for each of these states, we have one of these energy deficits, okay? Which says that, for example, if the loop momenta become very, very large, the sum of these energies in the denominator here will also become large, which tends to make the integral converge. But because these loop integrals here go out to infinity, this is where you go to states of arbitrarily high energy. And that's the way we can think about the origin of ultraviolet divergences in perturbation theory. And why? Because when you go out to infinity and get divergent, all of these denominators go to minus infinity. And so the divergence is in that sense, local in time and also in space. And that's where, as we discussed at the very end last time, this idea of local renormalization, renormalization in terms of polynomials in momenta rather than transcendental functions in momenta, where it comes from. So uh, here it just says we're I in C. So this is this sum here over all the particles in a given state means that line I was emitted before C and is not yet absorbed at some future vertex. So what this is, this is the general form <clears throat> for time-ordered perturbation theory. And this, uh, this numerator factor here, well, I don't know. Oh yeah, this L hat for all line momenta, right, it should really have been K hat, I think. For all line momenta in the numerator, these are all on-shell line momenta, which actually you get back something because it's in principle, it can simplify your numerator calculations, traces and things like that quite a bit because now everything in the numerator is on shell. So again, to give you a sense of what we're talking about, uh, that's a, it's a bad start. <laughs> oh, well. So we could have a complicated graph, you know, it's a time ordered graph. We really want to, so here we could have, uh, so way I write, like to write the times is this way. We start on the left and we go to the right. I don't know why, but that's what we do. Uh, well, it's the way you read, okay? 
But notice that this direction in time is the opposite to time ordered perturbation theory, where the earliest time is all the way to the right and time goes this way. So there's a sort of mismatch, but anyway, that's the way it goes. So this is C equals one. And this here would be the first state, S1. And so this is a two particle state. Now here's our second vertex, C equals two. Here's our second state, S2. Our third vertex, C equals three. And our third state, S3. Okay, and so forth. And you can see by the time we get to S3, we have a one, two, three, four particle state because particles have been emitted and not yet absorbed. But for a typical particle here, if this is say K1, here in the notation that we have you know, on the board there, this incidence matrix, eta one, one here, this is where the particle is emitted. So that equals minus one. Here, we have eta two, one, and that equals plus one. So, and these eta's keep track of how line momenta or line energies in this case, appear in the phase. The phase that eventually gives us the energy denominators. In only in state S1 does particle one's energy appear. It has a, a minus one where it first uh, shows up. And then when it arrives here in this integral, it has acquired a plus one. That canceled the minus one, okay? Leaving the state S2, which is independent of K1's energy. And that's exactly right because K1 does not appear in S2. And so it goes till all the way until you arrive at, let's see, what do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six. So C6, by C6, every particle has been emitted and then absorbed. So none of the particle energies appear in that integral. And the C6 integral looks like just the integral minus infinity to infinity d sigma six. And if this is a simple integral, say P1 is coming in here and P2 is coming in here, this would be e to the minus i P1 naught plus P2 naught sigma six. And that of course just gives the energy conservation delta function, okay? But the point about this is it's the same for every graph in the world, okay? And if this, this could be, you know, a graph in phi cube theory, but it could just as well be a graph in QCD where these are quarks and then here we have gluons. And this was known as, was famous for a while as the Mercedes-Benz diagram back in the day. Um, okay, any, any questions about this? Cause it's, it's a, a bunch of steps, but it's extreme. I mean, the, the beauty of it is we just did perturbation theory to all orders and we got a highly non-trivial and extremely general result, which applies to any, any quantum field theory, including quantum gravity. Okay, so, who, who, yeah. Yeah. Why does it alter the argument at all? Because, yeah, it doesn't, uh, the, it, the only thing the numerator does is occasionally in the numerator, so n, it's some, it's a polynomial, but it's, it's a polynomial which is linear in each, uh, ki naught or at most. And so what happens is when you do the integrals, 
this doesn't change the, the counting and you can always close the contours. So you're, you're all set here. And so uh, again, maybe I should just, just to give an example, uh, say for the, the KI naught integral, what would the KI naught integral look like here? Just as, as an example, the integral minus infinity to infinity dk, not ki naught, let's say k1 naught, <laughs> just to be specific, k1 naught over 2 pi. And here we had k1 naught squared minus omega 1 squared. Uh, uh, not, yeah, minus omega 1 squared plus i epsilon. And then it was e to the minus, oh, let's see, yeah, minus i uh, k1 naught sigma one, okay. Where sigma one, uh, no, I'm sorry, it's sigma two, all right, I may not get the sign right, <laughs> minus sigma one. And then so we rewrite this thing as k1 naught minus omega one minus i epsilon times k1 naught plus omega one minus i epsilon, where again here, omega one squared is equal to, well, omega one is equal to the square root of k one vector squared, which is a function of these L's and the external momenta P, you know, depending upon how we root the external momenta. So this is a function of the PJs and the L vector A's plus MI squared. But the i epsilons are always of this form, omega i minus i epsilon. That's the case for every single line. And then depending upon the sign of the sigmas, you close at infinity and you pick up a pole. And then at that pole, if you have a numerator factor k1 naught, actually k1 naught to any power, it's, you, it just converges because of the exponential behavior here. And you just replace that by uh, well, by what you replace it, okay? Well, okay, it gets more complicated for higher powers. You, if you had K1 naught squared, you could then write that as something that canceled the denominator, it just gives you a delta function. So that would be a contact term. And then you would get another term. But in for QCD, we're really only gonna get linear here, whether it be from a three gluon vertex or from a uh, fermion, uh, propagator. And so this is just going to be replaced by either plus or minus omega one. That will depend upon the time order as to whether you get plus or minus. And that means that these numerators, the numerator factor here we have at the end depends on the permutations of the vertices. It depends on which, which time order you're in. And then the, the energy could change sign. Okay, so in some sense, this was the like, you know, quantum field theory lesson part. Um, but any other, you know, what about type of questions or uh, anything else this, uh, about this? Okay, this is like a big deal. And to some extent, it's the center of the, of the lectures that I'm giving. All right, let's see where now, however, it was right in the middle. This, this is your new slides, so. <laughs> so I'm not gonna spend much time on, the, on, on these other slides. They just, they developed this idea, the next set of five or six slides develops this idea that we can see from time order and perturbation theory what a counter term really means. It, what it does is it replaces the energy deficit by sort of minus infinity in the denominator and then re, uh, uh, correspondingly replaces a loop integral by a constant. So those are where the divergences come from. In this simple case, you can see they come from self-energy type diagrams uh, or from uh, diagrams like this one. In 5-4 theory, these are the kinds of 
divergences you have, and then you add counter terms to cancel those different divergences. Okay, so we have this basic one renormalizing the four point coupling and then the self energies. So it just, uh, the next one develops this a little bit. <clears throat> And it says what it tends to give you when you have uh, calculations. If you define these things, uh, you, you can define them, say, by a, a cutoff method where you introduce some cutoff lambda squared. And then you could choose your counter terms here to have logs of this cutoff. Okay. So you just proceed in that fashion. Uh, which I'm sure everyone has seen if you got it to uh, uh, to uh, attend this <laughs> set of lectures this week. Um, and okay, uh, and there's some discussion about renormalization schemes, but we're really not going to use that in in any uh, definite way uh, in in this set of lectures. Uh, a few words in the next couple of slides about the renormalization group. And here, this is something that will recur when we talk about the origin of resummations, uh, is the basic idea that when we renormalize the theory, if we have something which is physical, like a cross-section, then the derivative with respect to the renormalization mass of the cross-section has to be zero. The renormalization mass is something that we put in, okay? And the way we did it was be, because we had to deal with these very, very states with extremely high uh, energy, which, you know, completely violate the conservation of energy, but are, have to be included in any quantum mechanical picture. So to make a consistent quantum mechanical picture, we added counter terms, and those counter terms depend upon a renormalization scale of some kind. And so, the derivative here has to be zero. And then the rest of the renormalization group equation, the, uh, the beta function uh, for the coupling and um, anomalous dimensions for the mass all come in as basically just using the chain rule. And so the point is, how is it that, you know, we managed to get a self-consistent thing. It's really, renormalization is an incredible thing. You introduce this arbitrary scale, and the way you get away with that is you say the coupling and the mass, and the masses in, in a complicated theory, all depend upon that scale. And, okay, let me not, uh, not dwell on it too much because this goes very deep, but I know that everybody will have seen it since you're doing quantum field theory in your research. Oops, this, this happens. I, don't, I really don't understand why that happens <laughs> every time I come on here. Okay, so this is just a little bit more. And we know, of course, the central object, especially in quantum chromodynamics, is this uh, beta function, which is um, uh, the derivative of, of the... Uh, of the running coupling with respect to the renormalization scale. And here's just an example of when you would do a calculation, you just do a calculation of a physical cross section, renormalize it, and at order G squared, the beta function will just simply occur as the coefficient of mu squared here. Okay. So here's the famous beta function from QCD. So, uh, yeah, again, uh, I think we should, in the interest of time, uh, just use these as reminders of these concepts and how we solve uh, for the running coupling from the function which the beta, uh, from the equation for the dependence of G on mu, which the beta function provides for us. And here's the famous result, of course, in quantum chromodynamics, which as everybody's heard is 50 years old uh, this year. Okay, so, and again, there's, uh, this, this is a term which keeps occurring because it's one of the profound ideas of tra dimensional transmutation. I think it was uh, the, the distinguished, uh, famous Sidney Coleman who came up with that, that term. The idea is that the running coupling, you're solving the beta function, you get the running coupling of one scale in terms of another scale. So you have like two arbitrary scales. But then you say to yourself, you know, it can't really be true that alpha s of mu two 
depends upon which mu one we started with, right? You don't like that. <laughs> so you'd like to replace this relationship between two scales by an arbitrary scale. Say, okay, I'll, I'll just have some fixed mass scale, which will uh, work for everything. And so that's uh, this lambda QCD, and then uh, introducing lambda QCD in this form, where you notice that that is a mu one here uh, as an overall factor, and then any other mu one here, which at which we uh, evaluate the running coupling, when we substitute this in, we get this alpha of uh, mu two squared for an arbitrary mu two is given by just some constant, of course, with this beta naught divided by the log of mu two over lambda. Okay, well, this is of course the lambda QCD. And then we see this is the place where, and we sort of talked about this yesterday, as we mentioned, it's the scale at which perturbation theory self-consistently tells you it's not self-consistent. Okay, it tells you, okay, I did what I could for you. <laughs> now you're going down to Lambda. You better add some new information because that information, the only information I have is that there is a scale Lambda at which the running coupling will diverge. Okay, And so that's where we have to add uh, new information. And in fact, that's that information in the right kind of quantities, that information will be formally suppressed by some power. It'll be higher twist. It'll be power suppressed in, in some large scale. Okay, so this leads us, it's, of course, the famous result, asymptotic freedom strongly suggests a relationship to the parton model. Now, why is that? Because it says that during, remember our picture of the parton model where, you know, there's an electron comes in, scatters off a parton, a quark, as, as we'll say. And that process happens where corrections due to the strong interactions are very, very small. So how could that be? And yet confinement would occur. Well, the idea is that this is a scattering. The quark electron scattering takes place on a scale which is very small of the order of the momentum transfer square, or yeah, or the one over the momentum transfer. So that occurs the parton recedes from the scattering and over longer distances, it becomes sensitive to the behavior of the running coupling at short, at, at, at long times, which is large because that's smaller momenta. Okay, so it's, it's a bit of this juggling using the uncertainty principle, the relationship between distances and energies or momenta. So as we go out to longer times, uh, more, uh, uh, and dependence on, on smaller momentum scales, then the coupling gets larger. Well, this is all kind of very vague, okay? <laughs> so, uh, but it's the intuition, which was immediately obvious to people when um, it became clear that, that you have a theory which at short distances or large momentum transfers is, uh, Oh, what does the coupling do at short distances? It gets larger or smaller. <laughs> oh, just come, come on, humor me. It's it's in the morning. You should say something, otherwise you won't be awake for the rest of it. You know, smaller. Thank you. I know. I that was saying humor me. Okay, so thank you. Uh, well, we have to figure out how to use this fact, right? I mean, it's sort of vague. Intuitively, it corresponds to the parton model. The hard scattering happened, and while it happened, the coupling was small. And then later, the coupling becomes large. Well, wait a second. Why does it become large later? Well, the distances were larger, but we're not doing this. We're doing this in momentum space. So how do we make this, how do we actually use this idea of asymptotic freedom? And that's what the rest of this is about. Okay. Okay, so now the, the rest of this is about, to, right, we, there is a, a concept which goes by the name of infrared safety. And what it really corresponds to is using the, this idea of, of energy flow. And we'll see how this comes to be. 
So to use perturbation theory in QCD and to use asymptotic freedom, which we feel is intuitively consistent with the successes of the parton model, we would like to choose mu, the scale at which we uh, do the renormal, uh, evaluate the running coupling as large as possible, just simply to make the strong coupling as small as possible. So why can't we just let it go to infinity and, and say, oh, there's no interaction anywhere? Well, because of course, you, given alpha s of mu, mu will appear in logs of the momentum uh, scales uh, divided by mu. So the question is how small, that is say, how small can we make alpha s? How small is possible? So, okay, so we sort of say, well, what could it look like? Suppose we had a dimension uh, cross section, which well, just we can make dimensionless by multiplying by any momentum scale, might it be uh, uh, the uh, overall, uh, say we have some SIJs, which are just serves a bunch of momentum around. So <laughs> say it's PI dot PJs or two PI dot PJs SIJ. And then we can define some uh, Q squared is S12, and then everything else is SIJs over S12, which is SIJ over Q squared. So these are all, let's say, of order one, and we'll come up with some uh, processes where this is a, a, a picture. So we have a, a total cross, or we have a cross section here. It's a function of Q squared divided by mu squared. It's then a function of the XIJs, these are the kinematic variables. And then if there are masses around, we have M squared over mu squared and then alpha s of mu. So this is what it could depend upon. And you could think of it as an expansion in alpha s of mu times coefficients, which are functions of q squared over mu squared, xij, and m squared over mu squared. And the m squareds are all fixed. And in particular, they could be the external masses of external momenta, they could be internal quark masses. And then also there's this issue of what about the gluon mass, which is zero. So there, m squared over mu squared would be zero, or perhaps more to relevant, mu squared over m squared is equal to infinity for any mu squared. So what are we gonna do about that? So generically, just because this alpha s of n is, uh, is <clears throat> alpha s is itself a uh, dimensionless quantity, this is a renormalizable theory, the ans depend logarithmically on their arguments. And in fact, we saw in Lance's uh, uh, lectures, of which I saw the, uh, just uh, yesterday evening, it's logarithms and other integrals which are based upon logarithms, which have the property of being integrals that just naturally go over into dx over x minus something, okay? And so uh, they're, in, in, when these things get large, they all become powers of logarithms plus non-leading terms. So the point is the choice of large mu results in large logs of m squared over mu squared. You can't make u arbitrarily large because then even the log of q squared over mu squared would go to minus infinity. So it's kind of natural to think, oh, well, I'll do is I'll, I'll calculate, I'll set uh, mu squared of order q squared, the xij's won't care one way or another, and then I just have to deal with the fact that I have mi squared over q squared here when I use alpha s of q squared, so, or alpha s of q. Uh, so what are we gonna do about that? So the answer to that, and this is to some extent, <laughs> the whole <laughs> the reason why QCD works, if we could find quantities that depend on the m's only through powers of the point of the type m i over mu to the p, where p, well, this this shouldn't be split, but anyway, p is greater than zero, then the large mu limit would exist. Okay, so it's really simple. If you can get that, if you can get this arbitrary thing, which depends on these m i squareds over mu squared in the form the order of mi squared over mu squared to the power of p, where p is positive, you would have left over some new coefficients an that depend only on q over mu and xij times alpha s of mu. And then when mu is chosen to be over order q, these depend upon finite variables. It's no logs are large. Maybe even the logs of q over mu actually vanish. So it gets like really simple, sort of, uh, times a, any at any finite order, 
plus terms which vanish in the limit that Q and hence mu gets arbitrarily large compared to the masses. Of course, if you have masses that are still like you produced a top quark, okay, and then you're at 300 GeV, then the mass of the top quark divided by your overall scale is order one, and you want to include that over in this part. Quantities that have this property here, we could call infrared safe. And we'll say a bit more about what, what that means. And then the whole idea of where the rest of this stuff is going <laughs> is that it's the use of this time order perturbation theory which will enable us to see why certain quantities are infrared safe. And in fact, also to show why certain quantities or it will help us to see why, why quantities factorize in the way that they do, where we get a mathematical justification of this parton model picture of pancakes as the so-called, uh, which contain all, all of the partons colliding, okay? So such quantities are called infrared safe. So here is, remember we had that thing, the left-hand side is what we measure and then the right-hand side is what we do, okay? So what happens is if you have a quantity of this form, if you measure the left-hand side, you then have a polynomial equation for the right-hand side. And if you pick any specific mu up to higher order corrections, which we're familiar with the way that, that kind of thing works, we can solve for alpha s of mu. Once we solve for alpha s of, or say alpha s of q, you know, depending upon uh, the process here. So we, we pick mu equal to q and then we get alpha s of q here and we can solve this equation to the accuracy of the number of terms that we've calculated for alpha s of q. If we measure the left-hand side, we're always measuring the left-hand side. It's sort of, it's like a certain, thing. <laughs> okay. So most of perturbative QCD is the computation of infrared safe quantities, the calculation of these ANs. Of course, then most of the perturbative QCD in which the left-hand side is measurable in the real world. Okay. So amplitudes play a kind of intermediate role in that. Uh, any, anything, question, objection? <laughs> Sneeze. Well, bless you in advance. Okay. Uh, yeah, and so these are like, this is totally out of date now. There's so many more points and so forth. But this, uh, you know, shows the experimental determinations of alpha s and mu. And we say, what, what do these things represent? Each one of them corresponded to a left-hand side that was measured and a right-hand side that was calculated typically the next leading order or next next leading order, that is to say alpha s, alpha s squared, or perhaps alpha s cubed. And then we just solved in each case. And it's kind of amazing if you think about it that way, that you get curves like this with measurements of alpha s versus the scale. The mu here is just the relevant q for that particular observable. And when you solve, for those alpha s of q's, you get a curve which follows the one divided by the log of, of q squared over lambda qcd squared. And yeah, these were values and, and yeah, it all sort of uh, is famously works. This is a slide which I should update, but the message is still the same. So this tells us if we're gonna find infrared safe quantities, we we ought to take a step back and say, well, if we're going to go about this in some kind of systematic way, we ought to know what's the origin of infrared unsafety or sensitivity. Where does this come from in the kinds of calculations that we'd like to do? And so that's what the next part of this uh, discussion here is about. And it's here where uh, first we're going to get some intuition just by looking at this simple diagram, which is a couple of, say, a die, uh, double photon uh, or gluon emission from a quark, let's say. 
uh, to talk about the generic source of infrared logarithms, which I'm, I know you've, you've heard about before. I heard about it from uh, Manuela, who I hope was feeling, uh, he was getting a drink. And, um, and also it, it's uh, in uh, the discussions that, that uh, landscape for sure. So the generic source of infrared logarithms is uh, soft and collinear momentum configurations. And we'll see, in fact, how that, uh, how that works, right? I mean, it's kind of cool to say this, but we'll see actually this follows, this follows in the most satisfactory way when it comes to physics. It follows as the night follows the day. It's like, we'll see, this is really why it happens. Okay, but even here, it doesn't happen in everything but it happens in most of the things where you build these big accelerators <laughs> and you get large momentum transfers. There it will follow as the night follows the day. But generically, we can see how it happens. We start out with a quark. It's maybe near the mass shell. Well, Q squared is about equal to M squared. It's going very fast. So we can say, uh, uh, say P squared is, is near zero. And what can it do? Well. Here's a state, right? So we're talking in the language of time order perturbation theory here, even though this could be inside of Feynman, it can, it is inside Feynman diagrams. This on-shell quark, we'll just call it on-shell and massless, can split into another quark and a gluon if the gluon has a momentum which is proportional to the quark's momentum. So this quantity alpha here is somewhere between zero and one, and then this guy has energy one minus alpha. Another thing, so now we have a state which is not just degenerate, but actually is in some ways of thinking about it indistinguishable from the original state. Because if the gluon were classically thinking right on top of the quark, how could you tell the two apart? Right? It would have the same color, it would have the same electric charge, it would have the same flavor, it would have the same momentum, but there are two of them there. They're just, you might have difficulty in telling the two apart. So it's not just that they're degenerate, but they're degenerate in a way which is physically, they have a physical uh, degeneracy as well. Another thing that could happen is that this uh, quark say now it has one minus alpha P, could emit a gluon with zero energy. And therefore, if it's on shell, zero momentum. So how would we be able to tell? Well, here we should be able to tell in some sense because color charge would be spreading out over space. But from the momentum point of view, nothing else has happened. So we have here three states with exactly the same energy who, uh, so in sense could all live arbitrarily long times and are all in some sense indistinguishable from each other. And they're indistinguishable in the sense of the flow of energy. And it's states which respect the flow of energy, which will in fact, but which are different in terms of quantum numbers and the distribution of quantum numbers between fermions and, and gluons and numbers of particles. These are the states that will cause infrared singularities. So infrared logs come from degenerate states. The uncertainty principle is delta E goes to zero, delta T goes to infinity. But we'll see it's not quite as simple as that, but we'll see how. After a while, non-collinear particles are too separated to interact, okay? So that can happen if, if particles are non-collinear. But for soft emission and collinear splitting, it's never too late for this to happen. So in other words, if I produce a quark and antiquark, Quark goes this way and anti-quark goes that way. We could say sort of, uh, you know, heuristically, after a while, they won't know about each other, except for maybe some string that's left over. But that's non-perturbative. Here we're talking about pertur perturbation theory. But if, if we're talking now about the quark that goes off in this direction, a gluon goes right along with it, the quark may say after, say, you know, 10 years, they've been traveling through space, Okay, time to come back. <laughs> and so the gluon gets absorbed. Nothing actually has happened. It's just that for some period of time, there was an extra gluon sharing the momentum with the, uh, all other quantum numbers being the same. And if Q 
k goes to zero out here, this could always happen because it's, it's zero energy in this process. The point here is that these processes, collinearity and soft emission, collinear emission, collinear absorption, don't change the flow of energy. And this will follow from a general analysis and lead to, uh, in particular, the infrared safety of jet cross sections, meaning we can calculate jet cross sections in the good way. Cal in other words, jet cross sections will give us a left-hand side, left for you guys, left-hand side you can measure, and a right-hand side, which we can calculate the finite order with a small coupling. Okay. So it means not only can we use it to measure the run, to measure the coupling, but once we know the coupling, we can make predictions for similar cross sections at higher loops. And, yeah. Oh, I love it. However, okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's something intuitively difficult about that <laughs> in the sense that color is spreading out with no cost to energy at all. And that is the difference between quantum electrodynamics and, and quantum chromodynamics. It's an extra feature that somehow tells us about the, the deep structure of this theory. But our, but remember, we're going to wriggle out of this because our, <laughs> our uh, goal here is to get quantities that are independent that, that won't depend upon whether or not these soft gluons have been emitted. Okay, so we're, we're going to say it, it, that, it, that question, that difficulty in understanding, what does it mean for something with zero energy to carry information on the color to arbitrarily long distances through soft gluon emission? How can we think about that? And what we're going to do is we're going to avoid it. Okay, and oh, and that brings us back to that term we had yesterday. It's, we're going to avoid it because we'll be looking for inclusive processes. We won't allow ourselves to ask a question like, what happened to the blue color? This was a blue quark and now this, this funny colored gluon came out and it left behind a red quark. I guess the gluon was purple or something, yeah. The soft gluon has a limit where it has to be collinear. And for, uh, we've seen double logs, I'm sure, in uh, Manuela's talks. And it's from that limit where a soft emission becomes collinear or alternately a collinear emission becomes soft. That gives rise to double singularities and in finite cross sections to double logs, the so-called Sudikoff log. But and other times they're only soft and non-collinear. We'll see that there's there are anomalous dimensions, so-called matrices, anomalous dimension matrices that try to, or that in fact can, for certain quantities, organize that those contributions from the contributions from that, that region. Okay. Uh, so what we're gonna say is, and, and this is the observation which is true, but which is not proved by these words. For infrared safety, the sum over degenerate final states in perturb we what we do is we sum over degenerate final states in perturbation theory, and we don't ask how many particles of each kind we have. So here's our inclusive. This is inclusive in the kind of intuitive language. This requires us to introduce another regularization, this time for infrared behavior. So we, if we we're going to talk about amplitudes. So what what we have is the infrared regulated theory is like QCD at short distances, but it's better behaved at long distances. So this is, this is how we do amplitudes, okay? This is, should say what amplitudes are about. The infrared regulated QCD is not the same as QCD. It's a different theory. It's, a, it's typically a theory in, in some other number of dimensions, except 
for infrared safe quantities, it will be the same theory. This actually is a statement in the form of a statement, but it's actually an assumption that we have to make to do these kinds of calculations. So similar considerations will apply to factorized cross sections and amplitudes. Now we remember we have, when we say an infrared safe quantity, we mean something that we can calculate to some finite order. Corrections due to masses will be down by powers of masses, which in general will have lots of logarithms, but they'll vanish like the power even though the logarithm goes to infinity. Okay, just to get a sense of how it works. Oh, I will get somewhere. <laughs> All right. Yeah. We can't calculate many things in QCD from first principles. But up to corrections of order masses divided by energies, there are certain quantities we can calculate from first principles. Those will be jets and E plus E minus annihilation. In other things, we can't calculate from first principles factorized cross sections, but up to the universal part-time distributions, which we could in principle calculate with lattice QCD, we can calculate the other factors in those formulas from first principles up to power corrections. And we could even calculate and organize power corrections if we expand our notions of uh, part-time distributions to multi-part-time distributions. Yeah. Yes. We can't do a calculation to finite order and perturbation theory. We can bring other methods to bear depending upon what what it is but in particular we could think of all all the rest of that could be calculated numerically if we had sufficient power and sufficiently clever uh ways of approaching it so qcd is pretty calculable actually overall infrared safety refers to that part of it where we can use perturbation theory to calculate good i mean these are we get that <laughs> infrared safety is not like reality. <laughs> it, it, reality is something different. All of QCD is real, <laughs> right? Parts of it are accessible with perturbation theory because they depend on the short distance, actual short distance behavior of the theory, where the coupling for intents and purposes, our intents and purposes uh, can be made, can be thought of as small, okay. So here's, here's an example of this idea that you have uses for infrared regulated QCD and, and uh, how in fact it can be that it doesn't depend upon the regulation. Okay, so we could start say E plus E minus annihilation, just sort of remind ourselves what we're talking about here. This is a positron annihilating with an electron and maybe someday these will be muons if there's a muon collider. It produces an off-shell photon with momentum Q, which is the total momentum of the pair. And then this produces hadrons. And we saw in the parton model, this would just be given by E bar E, Q bar Q. plus higher orders. So let's see what the nature of these higher orders is if we try this just at the first correction in QCD. So we're doing this in perturbative QCD in a regularized version of QCD. So here are the two regularizations. The simplest regularization is to take the gluon and give it a mass, okay? This is like at higher orders, this becomes problematic because of questions of gauge invariance and things like that. But here it works very nicely at one loop. And so you get two final states at order alpha s. Your two final states are one's due to gluon emission. And another is the interference between a virtual correction. So I'm going to write twice the real part 
of uh, this, uh, of an order alpha S correction here times the lowest order. Now notice, okay, this is, this, this is like quantum mechanics is just dripping off of this thing because this squared is gonna be positive. No matter what you do, if you take something and you take its absolute square, if it's a complex number, you're gonna get a positive thing, okay? But this guy, the interference between a virtual correction, I didn't draw the self-energy, but let's assume it, it, it's implicitly there, times the lowest order need not be positive. And in fact, it's not, it's negative. Because what this, the information that this has in here is all the other states that could have happened if, for example, instead of this gluon being reabsorbed, it had been emitted. The effect of those states is in fact included in here. So the same information is in real emission as in the virtual. And you say, why? Because they're all really time-ordered diagrams talking about one state following another. It's just that here, the three particle state is the one that makes it out to the finish line, gets the metal, you know. But here, the three particle state, ah, oh, I got tired, it got reabsorbed, okay. You know, and it's the two particle state that gets the metal, all right. But this interference, so if we did this, we took this one, <laughs> the emission plus the virtual, and we added them together, and we took the absolute value squared together, that would be kind of like, you know, one way of doing it. You would certainly get a positive number, but it wouldn't be the total order alpha S squared cross-section. So this is just the order alpha S cross-section. So it's not guaranteed to be an absolute square, and it's not, in fact. Okay, so we have the two possibilities, the three particle state like this, and the two particle state the three particle state, here, here's our log squared. This is exactly due to those soft plus collinear limits of Q over M gluon here. Uh, uh, this is big G should be here, but okay, or this could be a little G. We have a single log term and then we have some finite terms. Here we have for the two particle state, another log squared, another single log and then a different constant here. Although notice this zeta of two, pi squared over six is the same in both of them. Because uh, it's, it's, it's tied to the logs precisely because hidden in there somewhere there's the dialog that, that uh, Lance showed yesterday uh, and I'm sure other things. So anyway, you add these two together and what happens is the double logs cancel, the single logs cancel and the zetas cancel. And you just get the lowest order cross-section times alpha, one plus alpha s over pi. So we get this nice finite answer, okay? So this is one version of infrared regulated QCD. Let's look at another version. This is a version that's, you know, more to the, uh, I'm sure everybody has uh, done some dimensional regularization. So basically <laughs> this is the way to think about it, uh, you know, at, for these calculations, essentially any calculation, dimensional organization, all you're really doing is you're taking this uh, the sphere, uh, the two sphere, and you're extending it, you're changing the area of the two sphere. So depending upon your choice of epsilon, the, the excursion away from four dimensions, you make it somewhat larger or somewhat smaller depending on what you're trying to achieve with your dimensional regularization. And you can always find some kind of sphere in which you do that change in a given calculation in dimensional regularization. So anyway, you can do that. And then you get this in, in this version of the theory with this modified sphere at infinity or uh, modified two sphere, you get, uh, of course, totally different looking things. Uh, they instead of getting simple logs, you get double poles in this in this epsilon, the amount by which you change the sphere, and you get single poles. Notice the three here; it appears with a single pole. There was a three associated with a single log, right? Up. Oh. oh, okay. All right. Yeah, there we go. Okay. See, there's a three, and then the single. Yeah, here we go. And here's the three again. So it's the same three basically, but there are lots and lots of differences. But notice in dimensional regularization, you get this mu squared to the epsilon. So if you expand this epsilon, 
to uh, first order, you get a log of mu squared and that uh, mu squared over Q squared and that's season one over epsilon squared. That's what gives you your, well, single logs and then you get double logs as well. But you get much more, you get these poles. And you get here in red, the, the, you don't see a zeta squared over six anywhere. It becomes pi squared over uh, a zeta squared, zeta of two rather. But rather than pi squared over six, you get pi squared over two, you get different uh, finite quantities here. But when you add the two together, all of the poles cancel, all the logs cancel, and you're left with the same alpha s over pi. Okay, so these two versions of QCD are different in the infrared, but at short distances, at least in this example, they give the same answer. And that's the essence of why <laughs> uh, infrared safety, if something's really infrared safe, it will have this property of not depending upon the details of how our theory has been completed in the infrared. Did you have a question? Oh, the motivation is, is in some sense very simple. For step one, it obeys gauge, it doesn't interfere with gauge invariance of the theory. The gauge invariance, that is, remember, we talked about the physical polarizations of photons, and then there was a longitudinal polarization, okay. which you don't want to have for any on shell photons. It's true in the same way, and even more so, more uh, if it's. It's true in the same way for the non-abelian gauge theories. In general, if you regularize in the infrared with gluon mass and so forth, at higher orders, you will develop longitudinal or scalar polarizations, as they're sometimes called, which don't decouple from your theory. And then the theory is no longer unitary. And in fact, it was the great achievement of it. Well, one of the many great achievements of it, Helft and Veltman, back around 19, at the same period, 50 years ago, when asymptotic freedom, what, what they made it possible, in fact, to, to discover asymptotic freedom because they showed how to renormalize quantum chromodynamics. And in fact, the whole class of uh, spontaneously broken and unbroken uh, 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 gauge theories, non-abelian gauge theories, in, in the, and the particular thing that was the difficulty they had to overcome was how to keep unphysical polarizations, gluon polarizations, from coupling to the theory and carrying, and what they, they're like thieves, they carry away probability, okay? And they make things out of nothing and they take real things and return them to nothing. So it like the theory becomes not self-consistent. So it was only when we could do that. And so, and then the discovery of the host development and others as well uh, around the same time was that you could introduce this dimensional regularization as a way of taming the infrared or ultraviolet behavior in a, in a, in a controllable way, but maintaining the gauge invariance of the theory. Okay, and, and therefore de decoupling your uh, unphysical uh, degrees of freedom, which however, is almost impossible to do without, to do calculations. You have to introduce them in intermediate steps, but with the, the decouple. And that's, so again, here, the, uh, it, but in this particular case, we've seen that the, the far infrared behavior, which is dependent on how we renormalize or regularize rather, regularize the theory, all disappears in this simplest of infrared safe quantities, the uh, total cross-section here at, at one loop. And we'll show uh, shortly, well, anyway, by this afternoon, why it's true to all loops. Okay, well, here we are again. Uh, so generalized infrared safety, we sum over all states with the same flow of energy in the final state. And uh, the way we can do this is uh, we can introduce the so-called infrared state weight, where you could say d sigma, so this total cross section, we'll say d sigma d e, where we, we say, okay, we want the moment in our final state to have a property e, okay? So we can calculate some quantity e, and we'll set that value equal to the same little e here. 
And all we need for this function E, this could be rather an arbitrary function, is that if we have an E in which two particles have become collinear, all right? So we have a PI, and here was PJ, but PJ goes to the limit alpha PI where alpha could be zero or it could be some positive number, or in fact, it could be greater than minus one uh, and even negative and greater than minus one. So that this function of n particles should be the same as E with n minus one particles, but with these two momenta replaced by a single particle with momentum one plus alpha pi. Okay, so little, and if you think about it in a minute, this is exactly respecting energy flow, or we should say more generally, flow of, of four momentum. Okay, and so we could see that this is this, if alpha is non zero, these two momenta are collinear. And so it says if you have two particles that are collinear, this E treats it the same as if one particle had carried the whole energy. And then you can do this many times. It could be any number of particles. So it's all included in this particular uh, formula, which I think was it was written this way by Kuntz and Soper, I think, first, I, although I, in their discussion of jet cross sections. So again, uh, what we're doing here is neglecting long times. Uh, so if we neglect long times in the initial state for the moment and see how this works in E plus E minus annihilation, because E plus E minus annihilation, before the annihilation, there's no QCD, there's only leptons. So then things that are called event shapes and jet cross sections. Again, what we're looking at are these two transitions here that are the source of collinear and infrared singularities. Okay, so just a few words on what is infrared safety, and this is you know basically where we're getting today, or this morning. Infrared safeties are, uh, so this is a quote actually from a paper by De Rulia, Ellis, Floratus, and Gaillard back in 1978. Quantities are predictable if, A, there are finite and QCD perturbation theory, and the perturbation series is sufficiently convergent. Okay, so these are like reasonable thing, and B, Non-perturbative effects are not obviously dominant, so <laughs> go figure. They say, yeah, it works if it works, but, but actually the thing here is really A. <laughs> okay. If A is the case, then perturbation theory gives you a prediction. You can take it and see if it, if it works. So this kind of evolved over time and it got uh, updated as sort of QCD perturbation theory gives self-consistent predictions for a quantity C when C, uh, dash is dominated by short distance dynamics in the infrared regulated theory. And it remains finite when the regulation is taken away. And that's what we saw with, with the total cross-section for E plus and minus mileage. A uh, contemporary update, okay? And a third way of looking at it. Oh sure, those are uh, well. We'll uh, those are all all things that we have of amplitudes where there are infrared poles, like one over epsilon, one over epsilon squared. They are not finite when epsilon goes to zero. Oh, but then you can well, you could okay if you if you want a quote physical quantity, we could say. Uh, let's let's uh, do a cross section where we have a quark with a given energy, a uh, given momentum. So a differential cross section for quark momentum. That's it exists in the infrared regulated theory, but it's not infrared safe. And you take the regulation away, it will go to infinity or minus infinity, depending upon what order you calculate it to. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> So the contemporary update, or I would say is more of an aspiration, so the kind of thing I'm working on right now, that the quantity C, this infrared safe quantity, putative one, is infrared safe when C can be computed directly in four dimensions. And in fact, it's, we can calculate the total cross-section in order alpha S for E plus E minus annihilation. And the way we can do it is we just use the fact that 
well, I'll, I'll write it down, that we what basically we're using the optical theorem. Now the optical theorem uh, is just the statement that, okay, in words, it's that the total cross section is the imaginary part of the forward scattering amplitude. And for the very special case of total cross sections, which is for E plus E minus annihilation, this is the total cross section. It's E plus E minus annihilates and then produces anything. We sum over all the anythings. We'll call this final state X and we sum over X. This is equal to, uh, or anyway, that uh, equals some, some number divided by S times the imaginary part of the two point function. And this two point function for reasons is self energy here. It's essentially just the self energy of the photon. This thing is completely free of infrared divergences and it's easy to see that. And in fact, we'll see it uh, this afternoon, okay? I, oh my God. <laughs> okay, so here, this can be computed actually in four dimensions after you, uh, it's true, you have to, you have to regularize it in the ultraviolet, but once you've done that, you can compute it in four dimensions, the finite part in four dimensions. And that gives the total cross section without going through that song and dance we did before, where at order alpha s we summed over regulated two particle and three particle states. Okay, so these are, okay, we finally got to the end of part two. Now, <laughs> we have another 10 minutes uh, for this lecture and the one this afternoon, which we have to go over the, you know, we'll, we'll do what we can with the rest, uh, which is three and four. So what we wanna do is we'd like to prove, for example, infrared safety for jet and related cross sections for E plus E minus annihilation. So we'd like to generalize this total cross section and remember this optical theorem, the use of the optical theorem here. We're going to use that again by using our time order perturbation theory and show that, in fact, we can get a much stronger result than this. And one that applies to jet cross sections in E plus E minus, and which we can use in a wide variety of cross sections. This will provide a basis for factorization and DIS and PP and hard scattering cross sections. And what we'll need, or I'd like to at least discuss with you to see how we can do this to all orders is a review, uh, okay, uh, we'll review very quickly uh, infrared and, and ultraviolet divergences and dimensional regularization. We're going to need a method to identify infrared sensitivity. The sensitivity to long distance behavior we'd like to remove in uh, infrared safe quantities and, or, and factorize in, uh, in uh, quantities which involve hadrons in the initial state. And a method to identify when we've found a quantity that's infrared finite. So that will, this will, so these are two concepts we'd like to introduce in, in the next lecture, which are the so-called physical pictures and power counting for, this is infrared power counting, which is a little bit different than the ultraviolet power counting, which is essentially dimensional. Here it will have a little bit more of uh, the um, uh, Lorentzian type of, of geometry in it in, in a very simple way. And so what we'll be discussing in the next part is factorization for elastic amplitudes for parton-parton scattering. Uh, and we'll compare the cases of five-fourth theory in QCD. We'll talk a little bit about the, the role of uh, so-called word identities, where the word identities are just statements of how these unphysically polarized gluons separate from physical quantities and are organized. And uh, the way they're organized is so-called Wilson lines. Oh, let, me, let me ask, did Wilson lines get mentioned in the, in the lectures, any of the earlier lectures? No, okay, well, we'll, we'll I, I won't ask who knows 
Tell me afterwards if you know what Wilson lines are. Okay, so <laughs> our purpose is to describe, not perform explicit calculations and, and to describe the ultimate justification of infrared safety and of factorization. So um, let me, in the last seven minutes, because I'm not gonna go over, well, I can go over two minutes. After all, you know, you guys weren't all here at nine o'clock. I wasn't the only one who was late. Uh, <laughs> and I was late well, only two minutes. This is sort of a fun thing, I, I think, you know, to think about, because if we use dimensional regularization so much, to think about how consistently it allows us to take perturbation theory rules and in at least some cases to get something finite out of them. So here's how it works, okay? We start with the QCD Lagrangian. We write down Feynman rules. So that gives us a set of Green's functions labeled here generically by G. So they're GN, each has say some P1 through PN. And what we do is we take these and we evaluate them first with off shell P squared, say space-like P squareds, and we evaluate them in D less than four dimensions so that we do ultraviolet uh, uh, regularization. And then we renormalize, okay? And once we've renormalized our Green's functions, we could actually extend them to slightly more than four dimensions because now we've taken out the ultraviolet divergences that occur in four dimensions. In other words, we've regularized those sums over states of very, very large momenta due to the D3Ls of each of the diagrams. So that picture is a little bit here. So here's a picture in the plane of, of dimensions D. So it's sort of real D. There are zero dimensions here. This is quantum mechanics living there. And then D equal four is here, whoops, and Here's the imaginary part of D because this is really a complex thing. You know, these are poles. Notice that the thing in dimensional regularization, it's the amazing thing is that not just to order alpha S, but to all orders, it only gives poles. It doesn't give logs of epsilon, which is really incredible. So there's no branch cuts around, only poles. And that was really one of the great advantage, another great advantage from a technical point of view. So we have these renormalized Green's functions, and now we can take the renormalized Green's functions and go to slightly more than four dimensions. That's this area here. So we start out in slightly less than four dimensions. We've renormalized here. And then we say, okay, we can now in our regularized theory peak a little bit above four dimensions. So what we're doing is we're taking that quantity epsilon, which is conventionally something like two minus D over two. In other words, one half of D minus four. When we ultraviolet regularize, D is less than four, so epsilon is positive. But when we then peak above four dimensions, because we can do that in the regulated theory, epsilon has now become negative. And in this particular role here, we can calculate lots and lots of things. So when we talk about calculating amplitude, so the whole field, if I may say, of amplitudes assumes that we've done the regularization here and then we peak up here to more than four dimensions and we can calculate S matrix elements, we can do anything we want. The theory is completely well-defined to any finite order in perturbation theory. But now, of course, we don't live here. <laughs> okay, or maybe we do, but not this way, right? We wanna get to this point here out of this whole Plane D equal four has a special, that's, it's home. What can I say? <laughs> it ain't much, but it's home. You know, so we would like to get back home. And to get back home, we have to take our S matrix elements, which we defined up here at D, a uh, real part of D greater than four, and calculate a set of unphysical quantities, which are the infrared safe quantities, which are, uh, are finite in, uh, for some range of D less than uh, four plus some delta where delta you know, is something that depends upon the object you're calculating, but it's definitely finite. And then finally, those special infrared safe quantities, tau, 
we take back from this region with epsilon is negative and take them to epsilon equals zero, okay? So this is what it is. It's like this cycle. D less than four, we take care of the ultraviolet, we renormalize. D greater than four, we regularize. Here we regularize the ultraviolet, then renormalize it. We go to D greater than four, not too great, but just a little bit greater. And we can, we have now an infrared regularization. In that theory, we form our infrared safe quantities, and then we bring them back to D equal four. And that's really, uh, I think in some sense, in a nutshell, what it's all about. And the whole discussion of infrared safety is which taws can we bring back to four dimensions? There'll be in things, a few, few taws are like already directly physical, like jet cross sections and E plus E minus. But most of our taws have to do with hard scattering functions, the things we multiply parton distributions by at the LHC. I still have two minutes. So, <laughs> okay, so again, uh, here's our one loop uh, electromagnetic form factor. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend some time in D greater than four in the next uh, few transparencies. And we'll introduce these ideas, which will enable us to look at perturbation theory to all orders. So, but here, these are our, the virtual diagrams that, that, we, that went into calculating the total cross section. And we saw this. Uh, the neat thing, by the way, about this particular E plus or QQ bar production from a vector current, which is to say a photon, um, is that you actually don't need any ultraviolet counterterm. Okay. And the reason is when you calculate these things, they each have an ultraviolet pole, but they cancel. That's the quantum, that's the QED word identity. Even though these are gluons here, nevertheless, because this is a conserved QED conserved current the ultraviolet divergences will cancel. So D less than four, we actually don't have to do. We can just place ourselves in D greater than four. And when we do that, we find as long as the epsilon is a, uh, here we call it, uh, it's really minus epsilon squared and minus epsilon here that we encounter because the uh, epsilon is negative, okay? So there's a no UV counterterm necessary. And uh, so we'd like to find these poles. And the infrared poles, so this is where we're going to wrap it up, just with this statement. The infrared poles requires, first of all, that lines in the Feynman diagram go on shell. And they require, because we have to remind ourselves, all these lines have plus i epsilons, which means they're defined in the complex space. We think of them as contours in the comp every, every loop integral in loop integration of any component of momenta should be thought of as uh, an, a contour integral in a, a complex space of that particular momentum, loop momentum. So like any contour, a single pole doesn't, if you have some I epsilon that, that shifts the pole above or below the real axis, you're not going to get a divergence by doing that integral because you could take the contour and deform it away from the pole. So what we have to have are contours which are pinched. So it says pinch of momentum contours. It means that poles from either the same uh, propagator or from two, typically two different propagators come together, one on each side of the integration contour and pinch it so that it can't escape that particular point on the real axis. So there's no way in avoiding uh, these uh, poles uh, or an integration which is sensitive to these poles in doing the integral as it's defined for us. And of course, that means that the integrand will diverge where the contour is pinched, but that doesn't by itself give us a, a divergence. The integral has to be singular enough. So here we have to have an analysis in the complex plane of integration contours, and this will lead us to the famous Landau equations, which were mentioned in the connection of, uh, uh, of um, high order amplitudes. And uh, yes, Dave. Uh, um, and 
the integral has to be singular enough and there we'll introduce the idea of power counting. And the criterion for one and two on shell lines and the way to get these is that we're going to find that it, it, it seems like it should be a very complicated process, but for us at high energy, it'll turn out that these on shell lines describe a physical process. So I'll leave you with this thought for this morning. What will happen, the origin of collinear and soft divergences are cases where the quantum description that's encoded into Feynman diagrams corresponds directly to classical processes, where in fact, it isn't just production of one state after another. The momenta actually can be made to describe a physical process where particles start out at one point, propagate to another point in space-time as if they were propagating classically. In this case, that classical propagation is on the light cone, and that makes the analysis much, much simpler to carry out. So it's with those thoughts that I guess we'll take a, a break for coffee. Uh, if there's a quick question, otherwise you can get me at the coffee break. We, yes. Uh huh. Well, it. I believe the 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 it's it's a question that can only it's a sort of experimental theoretical question. <laughs> you try it and you see what happens. I think the the use of the effective uh, Higgs, you know, the the effective Higgs to GG and Higgs to gamma gamma vertex that you get by tw top loops is remarkably robust from a numerical point of view. But it is really a numerical statement. On the other hand, you can imagine, I think I, uh, I think it was mentioned uh, yesterday by Lance, I mean, you can do expansions, for example, in Higgs mass over top mass, and then you find out, oh, Actually, this is a pretty convergent expansion and it doesn't behave poorly until you go way, way above. But eventually, of course, at high enough energies, you really are in a situation where that top loop itself can form a final state. So you can actually have enough energy to produce a top pair. And then suddenly those two single Higgs and top pair, you, you don't want to neglect it completely. Um, yeah. But you, you wouldn't, oh, Lance is going to clarify. Yeah, but on the other hand, those final states are like completely different than the final states you get by producing a Higgs, which then decays. So, they're sufficiently different in terms of the, the final states that we really have some hope of, of, uh, of treating them as if those two processes were, didn't know anything about each other. And that's what the effective theory does. It says, yeah, the Higgs could go on shell, but for that you need 300 G, 350 GeV or more. And I'll, I'm, I'm sitting here at 125, don't bother me about that. You know? <laughs> When my ship comes in, I'll have more. Uh... <laughs> okay, so let's let's take a break.